1942. Nazi Germany's armed forces controlled most of Europe. The Gestapo, Hitler's most potent and hated weapon of fear, was at full stretch, rooting out opposition and implementing Hitler's final solution, the extermination of the Jews. What had begun as a domestic secret police force had gained the power of life and death over millions of people. Later, by 1945, as the Third Reich hurtled towards its destruction and Hitler raged in his bunker, the Gestapo was to plumb new depths of lawlessness and brutality. But in the aftermath of war, its officers would simply melt away largely unpunished. And the greatest mystery of all remains to this day, the fate of the creator of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller. Germans had lived in dread of the Gestapo since 1933. But what they would undergo in the declining years of Hitler's Reich would prove worse than their most horrific nightmares. Munich, the capital of Bavaria. This has been the breeding ground of the original Nazi movement. But in early 1943, leaflets began to appear around the university in the name of a group called the White Rose. It spoke for the growing number of Germans who were disillusioned by the war, and particularly Hitler's handling of it. It was directed specially at young people. The German people looks to you. We had to do it once before when Napoleon ruled. Now let's rise against this leadership, against this regime. The Gestapo reacted with customary speed and venom. The White Rose Group were inexperienced dissenters led by a young brother and sister, Sophie and Hans Scholl. Within days, the Gestapo had seized almost every member of the group. On the 22nd of February, 1943, after a brief show trial, the Scholls, along with another White Rose supporter, were sentenced to death and executed by guillotine the same day. The Gestapo had made a strong public statement. Its bosses realized they faced something new a rumbling groundswell of opposition at home. Some of this was prompted by the Third Reich's military performance, which was deteriorating fast. The assault on the east had failed. The extreme cold of the Russian winter had taken a savage toll, and the Wehrmacht had suffered immense losses. Almost a million men had died, most of them at Stalingrad, in the largest single battle the world had ever witnessed. The army's retreat was inevitable. Many of the Gestapo officers also found themselves returning to their homeland. But they didn't find the confident Germany they had left in 1941, although the leadership still appeared to believe in the Nazi dream. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels continued to stridently urge the civilian population to total war. The head of the German Secret Service, Walter Schellenberg, was a Nazi insider, a man in regular contact with the head of security, Heinrich Himmler. Our leaders had no understanding of conditions abroad. Their actions were determined entirely by their own narrow political views. None of them was willing to move from the recognition of the facts to the inevitable conclusion that the idea of victory was impossible. But the German people themselves were beginning to realize that the war was doomed. The upsurge of anger and overt challenges to the Gestapo mounted. Increasingly, it turned its focus back onto German society too in the last years of the war, as all the fears the Nazis had concerning the collapse of the home front come back to the surface. Nazi party propaganda may have been telling the German people one thing, but in their own homes, they were hearing another. The radio, once the most effective channel for disseminating the government's message, was fast becoming a threat to the regime, for radio waves know no borders. Hier spricht die Stimme aus Amerika. Zunächst die wichtigste Nachricht. In den Nächten zum Sonntag und Montag hatte die Royal Air Force zwei Großangriffe auf Berlin ausgeführt. 
Listening to foreign broadcasts was not only illegal, but treasonous. So the Gestapo clamped down. My grandfather was an enthusiastic radio amateur, and he always listened to English radio. My grandmother was summoned, and my grandfather said, I'll go with you, and he was immediately arrested by the Gestapo because he admitted that he had listened to Radio London. And the court sentenced him to two and a half years jail for listening to enemy broadcasts. Meanwhile, the Gestapo did not neglect its other task to complete the racial purity scheme, the final solution. This was something that the Gestapo chief Heinrich Müller took charge of personally. It had been his brief to do so, given to him at the Vance conference. And Müller took pride in completing an undertaking. Few pure-blood Jews remained in Germany, but Müller was determined to get rid of everyone. There were complicated regulations about the percentage of Jewish blood and intermarriage. Jews married to Aryans had hitherto enjoyed some protection from persecution, but no longer. Clara Helena Grading's father was Jewish, her mother a Protestant. In 1919, she herself married a Protestant, a respectable businessman with whom she had three children. She worked with disabled youngsters in the Kronberg Hospital and also did volunteer work with the Red Cross, a model citizen. But this did not impress the Gestapo. Her parents had been wealthy, but their fine house had been confiscated and turned into the local Nazi party offices, and their new home was also targeted. The letterbox was then smeared with a Jewess lives here or something. And where there was a stone wall, the garden wall, big letters were smeared on it, and things like that happened. From 1939, like all Jews in the Reich, Clara had to add an extra name on all documents. Sarah for women and Israel for men. Clara was careful to obey the rule, but one day in 1943, she forgot to write her extra name Sarah in her ration book. It was an absent-minded slip, but sufficient excuse for the Gestapo to call her in. Just a year later, on 25th May 1943, our mother had to report to the Gestapo as she had got a summons. We travelled in together. We went to Frankfurt West, then we separated. I went into the office and my mother went to 27 Lindenstrasse. That was a Gestapo. We agreed if we heard nothing by midday, we'd go there. We didn't hear anything, so we met up and we went there. 27 Lindenstrasse, Gestapo headquarters, Frankfurt. It was here that Clara and her daughters encountered the man known as Death's Accomplice. Heinrich Barb joined the Prussian police force in 1928. Nine years later, he was appointed to the Gestapo and since 1942 had worked in Frankfurt as Jewish affairs officer. Later, witnesses testified to his boasting that he had annihilated and exterminated 387 women. I came in. There was a big staircase that you had to go up to the office. An elderly man came tumbling down the steps with a loaf under his arm, and he said he'd been kicked down the stairs. He had only wanted to ask whether he should bring some bread to his wife in prison. He wasn't a human being, he was an animal. I don't know how to describe someone like that. Cold. You couldn't get any colder. Fat, buffed up, like in that picture, that's what he looked like. That picture in the paper's right, fat like that, bald and sneering and contemptuous. On Muller's instructions, the Gestapo continued to fill the concentration camps with Jews who had been overlooked in the first deportations. On the 10th of January, 1944, Clara Grading was put on a train heading east. On 19th February 1944, we had a small message in the postbox. 
How the card got to us, we don't know. And a few days later, the next message with the death certificate from Auschwitz. This was typical of Heinrich Müller. For him, the bureaucracy that condemned Clara to death was a useful instrument, and the complete eradication of the Jews a goal worth spending Gestapo resources on. It was a belief fully shared by Hitler. One's got to remember that to Hitler and to the Nazis, to Himmler, that the Jews were another enemy. Um, in fact, they were the enemy of all enemies. They were the enemy behind the enemy powers. Nazi propaganda made this quite clear, depicted everywhere. The figure of a stereotyped, demonized, eternal Jew supporting both the Soviet Union and the United States in the form of international capital. He carries a whip with which he beats down the Germans. It is an obscene reversal of the truth. But this was the basic lie on which the Third Reich was built. And so to, to them, it was vital that the uh, process of the, exter the final solution, the extermination of the Jews, took precedence, really, over even military operations. And this happens time and time again, where trains bringing reinforcements to the Eastern Front are diverted, kept in sidings and that, whilst trains run to the death camps. But Muller's zeal was destined to go unrewarded, for the war was soon to require the Gestapo's undivided attention. In 1944, the propaganda machine was cranked up a gear. Without greater home support, victory would be impossible. Die Zahl unserer Soldaten ist dauernd größer geworden. Sie müssen in Anbetracht ihres harten Einsatzes besonders gut und ausreichend verpflegt werden. Auch die Zuteilung von zusätzlichen Lebensmitteln an Schwer- und Schwerstarbeiter sowie an Lang- und Nachtarbeiter der kriegswichtigen Industrien steigert den Nahrungsmittelbedarf. German civilians at home were asked to do more to help. Die Einschränkungen, die die Heimat jetzt auf sich nehmen muss, sind natürlich empfindlich. Aber sie stehen in keinem Verhältnis zu den Opfern, die jeder Soldat an der Front täglich zu bringen hat. But it wasn't that easy. With the population increasingly disenchanted with the Nazi regime, words were not enough anymore. The Gestapo began by tackling all those who did not obviously conform to the Nazi archetype, and those not fully signed up to the Nazi people's community. Anyone who appeared to reject the Teutonic ideal was suspect. And anyone who imitated the lifestyle of the enemy became a Gestapo target for treason. And we had then, even after these examples in the Zeitung, we had other models. We had these pictures in the papers that the Nazis themselves put out, and we took them as models, and we tried to look like them with longer jackets and longer hair. That was our attitude. And of course it was really a thorn in the side for the Nazis. It was obvious that we didn't belong. We were trying to distance ourselves from them. We were mad about jazz. And we danced swing. We were passionate about dancing. Later they called us the swing kids. The propaganda machine went into overdrive, viciously denigrating Americans, blacks in particular. Swing is Trump. We are not in Africa, but in New York. Auf dieser Tanzkonkurrenz der Nigger werden Urwalderinnerungen als neueste Errungenschaften amerikanischer Zivilisation aufgefrischt. Weiße Menschen legen anscheinend Wert darauf, die Nigger noch zu übertrumpfen. Das hier sind Teilnehmer einer Swing-Dauertanzkonkurrenz. The German Swing Kids were just lads wanting to rebel. Swing was cosmopolitan and relaxed, everything that the Nazis rejected. But they were accused of undermining their country and of betraying the brave soldiers at the front. It was put down in interrogation transcripts. What the youth was doing was a threat to the state. Building cliques outside of the Hitler Youth, it threatened the state and national morale, put state security in danger and so on. 
the Gestapo caught the swing kids in its net. Two figures stood there with hats and long coats and with a car, and we drove to the station. They got going there. They started beating me already. And then later at the interrogation in the basement, where we were locked up and interrogated, we were kicked down the stairs. They got angrier and angrier. They wanted to hear something specific that they'd set out already, probably written it all down already, to report to Berlin their heroic action, what they found out amongst the youth, and how subversive they were, and criminals too. I couldn't give them that pleasure though, and the more they beat me, the more frightened I became, because I thought, there must be something terrible behind this. If people behave like this, there must be something terrible behind this, if people behave like this. It was the same story all across Germany. I was locked up overnight in the basement of the Gestapo building and stayed there 20 days. Then I was released. There was no official charge or anything on the part of the Gestapo. I was simply locked up. The Gestapo could imprison and torture with complete impunity. Every single one of these people was a state employee, it was covered by state permission and was capable of murder without having to justify themselves afterwards as to why they'd shot someone. There were no limits at all. They were all potentially cold-hearted murderers. Although support among ordinary Germans was not what it once was, the Gestapo organization still relied heavily on informers. The card indexes that were so religiously kept in each of its offices contain all the denunciations and records of what actions followed. Any German citizen, even the racially spotless, could now fall victim to the Gestapo. Anna Marie S. was denounced as a prostitute. She was taken to the Gestapo HQ in Cologne, the Elder House, on the 7th of November, 1942. Held without charge for two weeks, she was then released under a curfew, under which she had to be home every night before midnight. For two years, Anna Marie obeyed the restriction. Then, one night, she arrived home 15 minutes late. Denounced by a neighbor, the defenseless woman was arrested and deported to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Two months later, she was dead. But these routine persecutions disguise the fact that the Gestapo was not reaching the core of real and growing German dissent. And soon, it would have to confront a challenge that would prove all but overwhelming. The Nazis' bid to conquer Europe had seen all its able-bodied men drafted into the German armed forces. On the home front, the shortage of labor was severe. Vital industries, even the munitions factories, were in disarray. The Allies solved this problem by putting women workers into farms and factories. Nazi ideology that decreed that a woman's place was in the home prevented that happening in Germany. By 1944, Allied bombing had rendered the labor shortage even more acute. A solution had to be found urgently. Für unsere Rüstungsindustrie und unsere Landwirtschaft wurden ferner als Ersatz für die zur Wehrmacht eingerückten Männer rund zweieinhalb Millionen ausländischer Arbeitskräfte herangezogen, die jetzt ebenfalls von uns ernährt werden müssen. Initially, the workers were voluntary recruits, but there were too few volunteers to keep the massive German military machine running for long. So the authorities turned to forced labor and began to import workers from the German-occupied countries. In the end, almost seven million of them. The Gestapo was entrusted with the task of choosing candidates for this involuntary journey. It was one of the biggest enforced migrations that had ever occurred in world history. Elena Moskiewicz was a young Jewish resistance fighter who had secretly infiltrated the Gestapo offices in Brussels.
One of my daily chores was the sorting of various lists of hundreds of names and addresses and classifying them by district in alphabetical order. The names were those of men to be impressed for forced labour in Germany and they were to receive or had already received the dreaded summons. A few of these were usually earmarked for arrest for having failed to respond to the summons. And even though they were absolutely necessary to the war effort, these foreign laborers were far from well treated. Polish and foreign workers came to Breslau. My brother and I, we saw that they were not only second class human beings, but third class human beings. They were labeled with a big letter P sewn onto their shabby clothes. We had to see how hungry they were and how lots of people spat on them. But not all Germans were hostile. Some smuggled food and drink to the workers. For the Gestapo officers, this alienated workforce represented a huge security problem. Their solution was predictable. In the absence of accurate intelligence, they randomly made examples of anyone who attracted their attention. An Italian called Salvatore Bettarelli was falsely accused of sabotage. There was a shed like this room here, you see, and I was cutting the timber, and uh, the foreman came in and said to me, go out. See, so immediately I went out. When I went out, you see, behind the door, there were two big, burly Gestapo men, you understand? And I went out in the innocent, you see, and of course they grabbed me and I pulled back. See, when I saw the Gestapo, I said, problem here, big trouble, you see, and I pee myself. He was sent to a special Gestapo-run concentration camp for so-called work education. For most trainees, this represented a death sentence. So I was looking out the guard, you see, and there was an Italian prisoner kneeling down on the outside, the barrack, you know, making it like a footpath or a carriageway, and he was putting bricks down, hedgeways, see? And, uh, and he was kneeling down and laying these bricks down, you see, and two officers went by. I was looking through the keyhole, See? And he just took the pistol out, shot him dead. Just like that. Bertarelli was fortunate. He managed to survive until the camp was liberated by the British Army. The 20th of April, 1944. It was Hitler's birthday, a day of national celebration when the leaders of the Reich strove to outdo each other in gifts to please the Fuhrer. In the past, these have been reports of new successes against the enemy. This year, though, there was less success to offer. Das Geschenk des deutschen Volkes zum Geburtstag Adolf Hitlers war ein einziges Bekenntnis der Treue zum Führer, des festen Willens zum Kampf und unbeugsamen Widerstand bis zum Sieg. In der Reichshauptstadt mit dem Wachregiment ziehen die Berliner die Straße unter den Linden entlang. The flimsy paper flags and thin cheers were a faint and puny echo of the giant rallies of Hitler's glory years. The Gestapo's technique of indiscriminate terror was successful in keeping disaffection under control, at least on the surface of society. But its inability to gather hard and accurate intelligence was a weakness that had cost it dear in the past and would do so again. The army had its own code of honor, it had never been penetrated by Gestapo spies, and there were senior military traditionalists who increasingly despised the upstart Nazis. These high-ranking dissidents were quite capable of outmaneuvering the Gestapo and planting a bomb right next to Hitler himself. 1944, and it was clear that Germany was heading for defeat. The Gestapo became increasingly arbitrary in its denunciations. Failing to grasp the rising level of anger within the military upper echelons, there was no inkling within its ranks that a group of conservative officers under the leadership of the charismatic Count Klaus von Stauffenberg 
was planning to depose Hitler. Stauffenberg was typical of the military leaders of this plot. He was without doubt a deeply committed Christian, but it was not these Christian elements in his makeup that motivated him to assassination. If that had been so, he would not have waited until July 1944. He was above all a passionate soldier, and he saw everything from the standpoint of his profession, and it took military disaster to shock him into the opposition. On the 20th of July, 1944, Stauffenberg attended a meeting of the chiefs of staff called by Hitler. He had his briefcase with him, as usual, but this time it contained a bomb. Once again, fate intervened. At the last minute, Hitler moved the meeting from a concrete bunker to a wooden barracks above ground. Stauffenberg planted the bomb and left, and it exploded. But the flimsy wooden structure dispersed the blast, and although four officers died, Hitler survived without a scratch. Das ist der Schauplatz des verbrecherischen Anschlages, den ein kleiner Kreis gewissenloser Offiziere am 20. Juli auf den Führer und auf den Stab der Wehrmachtführung verübte. It was chaos. In the immediate aftermath, Stauffenberg and the conspirators believed that Hitler was dead. They moved into action, making arrests, occupying important buildings and mobilizing troops. But something was wrong. According to Stauffenberg, everything was proceeding splendidly. The tanks were on their way. They would reach the city center very soon. Then the real action could begin. As yet, we'd received no disturbing reports of Gestapo or Waffen-SS activity. I said urgently, too little is happening. Let's drive over to the Prince Albrechtstrasse. We must eliminate Muller and Goebbels. But Heinrich Muller had already recovered from the shock of the attack. The conspirators were easy to identify and the Gestapo quickly set about rounding them up. Once it was known that Hitler was alive and well, the rebels knew they had no hope. Most of the ringleaders, including von Stauffenberg, were executed that very night. The Gestapo was smarting from the humiliation of yet another failure to protect the Fuhrer from potential assassination. So its officers arrested and interrogated every contact and relative of those they believed to be involved. Hundreds were sent to the camps. Jakob Leonhard, a Swiss double agent, was in a Gestapo prison at the time. We heard about the attack on Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944. But even without this, we'd have soon realized that something bad had happened to the Nazis. There was a clampdown in the prison. Any relaxation of the regime or special treatment was immediately cancelled. Then something strange started to happen. Women, old men, even children started to be brought into the prison under this so-called protective custody. For days, the prison echoed with the cries of pain of the women being tortured half to death, who called out just to go home. Once again, we thought our hour had come. At any moment, we expected to be liquidated en masse just to make place for more German racial comrades. Some of the Stauffenberg conspiracy cases reached court, but only as show trials for propaganda purposes. The Gestapo had been above the law for 11 years. As Jakob Lenhard had already discovered, the Gestapo's word was judge, jury and executioner. The courts were there simply to rubber stamp whatever the Gestapo had said, and at the same time to humiliate its victims and to issue ever harsher sentences. The members of the court came back into the courtroom bareheaded and silent. Accused, stand up. Accept our judgment and the reasoning behind it. There is no direct proof of anything of which you've been accused. However, it can certainly be assumed that you are guilty. The People's Court therefore sentences you to death on the guillotine. The sentence will be carried out immediately property of the accused will be seized. There was no chance at all that any of the conspirators would receive anything resembling a fair trial. Their only hope was to run or to go underground. Anyone not already executed would fall into the Gestapo's hands within hours. The Gestapo was there very quickly, the same day, and then all the time. 
Franz von Hammerstein's father, Kurt, had already died a loyal army officer who despised Hitler and his thugs. Two of his sons, Kunrat and Ludwig, were part of the Stauffenberg plot, and the Gestapo soon discovered this. Und hat versucht, they tried to find out from us where my brothers were. We pretended we didn't know anything, and it actually worked. Und das ist tatsächlich gelungen, nicht? Aber immerhin wurde zuerst ich dann. But then, at the beginning of August, I was arrested, and then my mother and two sisters in October, and I was brought to the Gestapo prison in the Lehrerstraße. Im Gestapo Gefängnis in der Lehrerstraße. The von Hammerstein family somehow kept their secret, and the brothers were never caught. Very few others escaped the net. Hans Bernd Gesevius escaped over the border into Switzerland, painfully aware of the horrific fate of his fellow conspirators. For day and night, even when they ate, even when they walked to the scaffold, they were fettered hand and foot. They were not fed so well or treated so comfortably as the Nuremberg war criminals. But it is not possible to describe the kind of interrogation that took place in the Prince Albrechtstrasse. We do know, however, those martyred men heroically kept their silence. But it could not have been easy to die amid the mocking laughter of the Gestapo men. Muller's sadistic bloodbath was his revenge for the Gestapo's failure to prevent the attack. However, the days of his lethal rule were already numbered. In late 1944, Allied bombing destroyed the Gestapo's head office in Prince Albrechtstrasse, although it did not halt its work. Groups of officers reformed around impromptu bases, carrying on much as before. But the Allies were closing in. As the day of reckoning approached, the Gestapo officers began to feel something familiar to their victims, the shiver of cold fear. 1945, and time for the Gestapo had almost run out. The concentration camps were still full. Some of the prisoners had been kept alive for show trials, planned to celebrate the final Nazi victory. They included prominent anti-fascist activists, among them military men, Christians, and Georg Elsa, the carpenter who had tried to assassinate Hitler in 1939. With victory a forlorn hope, the ever-efficient Gestapo chief, Heinrich Müller, took the time to issue an order to the camp commandant. Elsa and the others were shot on the 9th of April, just days before the camp was liberated. As the Red Army tanks approached Berlin, Hitler emerged from his bunker one final time to survey the wreckage of his dreams. He was accompanied by Heinrich Müller, but Müller did not intend to see it through to the end with his Führer. He is recorded as saying, I know Russian methods. I haven't the slightest intention of being taken prisoner by the Soviet troops. Muller then disappeared into the smoke and chaos of the blistering Russian attack. His immediate superior, Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS and joint founder of the Gestapo, also attempted to escape, but he was caught by British soldiers. In Lüneburg lies the body of the most hated man in Europe, Heinrich Himmler, chief of the Nazi secret police and the savage SS troops. Captured while posing as a civilian, Himmler was carrying tiny vials of poison. Under examination, he bit into one concealed under his tongue. Propped up for official photographs, this Nazi who terrorized the continent has met in violent death his proper end. Hermann Goering, the first leader of the Gestapo, was also captured. Facing an almost certain death sentence at the Nuremberg trials in 1946, he too swallowed a smuggled cyanide capsule. It killed him instantly and turned his corpse bright green. So ended the Gestapo, Hitler's deadliest weapon. The sword had been shattered. But what of the Gestapo officers who for so long had presided over a reign of terror above the law? What happened to the man who had tortured and killed with neither reticence nor restraint? Some were brought to justice. Heinrich Barb, the Jewish affairs officer at the Frankfurt Gestapo, 
who deported Clara Grading, was brought to trial in his hometown, Frankfurt. He stood accused of deporting gypsies as well as Jews to the death camps in the East. Witnesses were called who testified to the brutality with which he treated the victims. He denied everything. The whole police force, including female officers, was involved in these mass evacuations. There were about 40 to 50 regular police, finance officers and rationing officers. We followed the guidelines of the Reich Security Office to the letter. Obeying orders was not accepted as a valid defense. Barb was involved in the deportation of some 20,000 people between 1941 and 1942. He was convicted and sentenced, remaining in prison until 1972, long after most other Nazis had been released. Oswald Gundelach, who had delivered deportees from Würzburg by train to the death camps in eastern Poland, went undetected until 1947, when he was arrested by the Americans. He was accused of hunting and killing US bomber crews that had been shot down, a favorite Gestapo exercise. At his trial, there was no mention of his role in the deportations. Nonetheless, he was sentenced to death. But this sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. In 1953, he was released, having served just six years. The following year, Oswald Gundelach was back in uniform. He joined the regular police force, his war record and conviction deemed no impediment. He was promoted to superintendent and retired in 1963. His retirement certificate thanks him for his 40 years of service. Those 40 years include his time as a Gestapo officer, deporting men, women and children to death camps and murdering Allied bomber crews. Kurt Lischka had been bureau chief of the Gestapo, first in Cologne, then Paris, where he had been responsible for the deportations of Jews and the arrest and torture of resistance fighters. After the war, he returned to Cologne, where he lived quietly in the suburbs. Then, in 1971, he was tracked down by the French Nazi hunters, Serge and Beate Klaasfeld. Although he had been convicted in absentia by an allied military tribunal in France, a legal anomaly meant that Lischke could not be tried in Germany. We tried to bring Lischke to France, to the French military tribunal that would be able to convict him. We wanted to bring him to Paris, to his former office in the Rue des Saussets even, and tell journalists, Lischke is back in France and the French authorities should arrest him and try him. The attempt to transfer him to France failed, but the pressure brought by the Klaasfelds led to a change in German law. And in 1978, he was finally put on trial in Germany in a blaze of media publicity. 35 years after he committed his heinous crimes, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. When I saw Lischke, I just thought, what a cowardly, wretched figure he was. And I had to think, this man had made decisions about life and death. In 1960, Adolf Eichmann, chief bureaucrat of the Final Solution and officer of the Gestapo was snatched from hiding in Argentina and brought before an Israeli court. The man who had lounged beside the fire with Heydrich and Müller after planning the genocide of millions found himself on trial. He also claimed to be following orders and that as a mere pen pusher, he didn't kill anyone. But there was sufficient evidence to prove that Eichmann did indeed have the blood of millions of Jews on his hands. Eichmann's assistant, 
Dieter Wislecheni gave evidence of this at his trial. Eichmann told me that the words final solution meant the biological extermination of the Jewish race. I realized that the order was a death warrant for millions of people and that the power to execute this order was in Eichmann's hands, subject to the approval of Heydrich. And yet Eichmann denied all responsibility. Meine Schuld ist mein Gehorsam, meine Unterwerfung unter Dienstpflicht und Kriegsdienstverpflichtung, unter Fahneneid und Diensteid. Die Führerschicht, zu der ich nicht gehörte, hat die Befehle gegeben. Sie hat meines Erachtens mit Recht Strafe verdient für die Gräuel, die auf ihren Befehlen an den Opfern begangen wurden. Aber auch die Untergebenen sind jetzt Opfer. Ich bin ein Eichmann was sentenced to death. But he is the exception rather than the rule. Perhaps the most astonishing thing in the whole story of the Gestapo is how few of its officers were punished for their crimes. Even high-profile officers, known to be guilty of gratuitous cruelty, survived denazification and re-entered the post-war police force. The majority of Gestapo officers, whose actions had brought terror, suffering and death to millions of human beings, merely removed their swastika insignia and got on with their careers. For the fact is, they had convinced themselves that they were just ordinary policemen, caught up in a cycle of madness devised by Adolf Hitler. The deeds of those years simply dissolved in their memories. As for Heinrich Müller, whose cold-blooded efficiency had shaped the Gestapo and forged its reputation, his fate remains a mystery. His was not among the bodies found in the bunker with Hitler. There was a rumor that he'd gone over to the Russians in Berlin in May 1945 and surfaced in Moscow, where he carried on his trade as a secret policeman. Another story is that he was scooped up by the Americans, and this story gained some credibility when one remembers what happened to Klaus Barbie, the Gestapo chief of Lyon, who was in fact recruited by the Americans after the war as an expert on subversion and uh, communist activities. None of these rumours have ever really been substantiated and all the best evidence we have, circumstantial as it is, really suggests that Müller was killed in the last couple of days of the war. There were many people who had been part of that circle around Hitler in the bunker in the last few days who claimed to have seen his body. Unlike Himmler and Heydrich, Müller had remained anonymous, and he alone of the Nazi bosses could have walked the streets of Berlin completely unrecognized. There is a grave with his name on it, but when it was investigated, it proved to hold the corpses of three people, none of them Heinrich Müller. Ultimately, the Gestapo could not have been as effective as it was without the complicity of the people. Its inability to prevent assassinations shows its inadequacy as a police force. But it excelled at encouraging people's basest instincts. It brought about a climate of fear in which pettiness and disloyalty could flourish, where denunciation became a way of life and where opposition became treason. Out of my experience with 12 years of Nazism, I cannot help maintaining that German guilt does exist. It is a reality. All of us fell into dangerous, evil ways. We were guilty of failure to understand, of willful blindness and misguided obedience. In the final analysis, there were millions of unteachable persons across the world who made a pact with the forces of Nazi revolution. They only came to their senses when the revolution swallowed them alive. I have no intention of clapping myself or my friends on the shoulder saying at least we did what we could. The success of our oppositional efforts proves we should have done much more. <laughs> <laughs>